John Deere has just reported its earnings before the market opened, and we can see it is down around 2.5%. Now, it has slightly recovered. It was down 5% not too long ago. Today, we're going to find out why after posting some very strong earnings, it is down. We'll look at the analysis. We'll also look at their latest investor presentation from just this morning. And as always, we will do our deep dives looking at their total revenue growth year on year, as well as their bottom line net income. We'll also look at the health of this company, total cash versus total debt. And as always, we want to look at both insiders as well as institutions as to whether they are buying or selling quarter on quarter. And we'll touch upon the dividend safety, some of the underlining financial metrics like the free cash flows, the debt levels. And as always, and importantly, we'll run it through the valuation. What is our intrinsic value? What is our acceptable buy price? given the investor margin of safety, and what are Wall Street forecasting over the next 12 months? So let's jump into their earnings. And firstly, the headline reads that John Deere quarter two results, they did beat Wall Street. However, they have cut their 2024 profit outlook. The major reason for this, farmers are buying fewer tractors. Now, one of the things they have done is lowered their forward guidance and their profit outlook has been reduced to around 7 billion. Now, their previous target was around 7.5 to 7.75. So that is quite a big drop as we can see here. So this is one of the reasons, as we mentioned, it did drop more than 5% before the market opened. Now, when we take a look at how they've performed against the analyst targets, well, we can see here for their earnings per share, it was around 853, whereas the essential analysts were targeting 786. So we do note a beat. Although when we look at the same number from a year ago, 965, it is lower. And the same can be said for their revenue. It is down around 12% to 15.24 billion. However, it is above Wall Street's target of 13.26. So in summary, they did beat earnings and quite significantly, however, they have lowered their forward guidance on the net income. On top of that, their numbers are lower from the same quarter last year, which we'll look in detail later when we go through the investor presentation. Now, top line revenue growth, as always, we do want to see minimum 3 to 7% growth. 36 billion reported in October 2014, 61.2 in the latest annual report. So nice growth, nearly double their top line. And when we do take a look at it on a graphical basis we can see it does move in the right direction it is trending upwards we'll look at the percentages shortly too to see how much percent they have increased year on year one thing to note with this company in the agricultural industry, it is fairly cyclical, something we will probably see when we do look at the numbers. In terms of bottom line net income, 3.2 billion in 2014, 10.2 billion on October 23. So we note, in fact, their bottom line has increased more than three times. And again, we can see the overall trend on the income statement moving upwards, both revenue and net income. So good signs there. When we take a look at their balance sheet, a quick health check, 3.6 billion in 2014, 3.8 from that latest quarterly report. And we do note over the longer term, very inconsistent year on year. As we said, not too far off the amount they held around 10 years ago. Now, that is something that we can look at, but in isolation, it doesn't mean too much. Let's compare it to their total debt numerically and directionally. And what we can see, whilst their cash has remained fairly flat, their total debt has increased 37 billion to around 64 in that latest report. And as we can see, the trend, whilst the cash is inconsistent, the total debt does seem to be increasing over the longer term, something we need to consider when we do look at our dividend safety as well as the debt levels too. Of their earnings, well, they have an incredible track record. They've beat over the last four quarters quite significantly too, just the last quarter by 98 cents. We have $1.90 Q3 of 2023 and over a dollar when we do go back a year ago. So 100% track record, very strong. But what we do anticipate over the next four quarters is double digit streak increase to their earnings per share as we can clearly see here so this is one of the reasons we do see the market down in essentially around the five percent in the pre-market although it has started to recover shortly something we do need to essentially factor into our investment thesis and our margin of safety now when we do take a look at the valuation grade they get a c overall when we look at a few of these metrics the one we normally draw your attention to PE on a non-GAAP basis, 15.16. So it is lower than the sector median of 19.42. In fact, a discount around 22%. 
and we do have other metrics here that you can see a lot of people will also like to look at other ones like the price to sales the price to book as well as some that incorporate the EBITDA you can see it here if you do want to incorporate all of them on average you do get a C grade purely however on a P non-GAAP basis it is a B stamp of approval when we take a look at the growth rate, well, they get a C minus. What we do note here is a 9.18% year on year growth, sector median 5.22. So a lot better, which is good. However, on a forward basis, we do anticipate a small drop to their top line, whilst the sector is bringing around 6.23%. We do see other metrics here. Another one that we do like to focus on is the earnings per share growth year on year for the next five years. 4.29 anticipated. We can see the sector double digits 12.05. So no surprises why they do get a D minus grade there. When we take a look at their profitability, well, we notice an A plus. So very strong on a gross profit margin, 35% beating the sector of 31. When we look on a net income basis, 16.4, significantly better than the sector of six. And another thing that we can draw your attention to, the cash from operations just under 9 billion, whilst essentially the sector median around 314. So in conclusion, what we have here is one buy rating from Wall Street. We have two hold ratings from Seeking Alpha and Quant. We also note a C on the valuation, a C minus on growth, and an A plus on profitability. Now, for those that like to see the comparisons against others in the sector, we have those in a similar sector and size. We have Qboat Corporation, CNH Industrial, and a few others. Now, these are all in the agriculture and farm machinery with a relatively roughly similar size. In terms of looking at their performance over the last year, total return, including dividends reinvested, we noticed that deer are around 10% up over the last 12 months. Not the greatest return over a year, but also bear in mind in this industry, they are one of the best performers. When we expand it over the last five years, we see they are 197% the best performing by quite some way. And over the last 10 years, we can see very strong 438%, in fact, outperforming the S&P during this time. What we would say, however, is that even if you are looking to invest in this, just bear in mind in your own investment analysis, Past performance does not indicate how they'll perform in the future, but it is good to see their track record, not just on their earnings estimates, but also on the share price total return is looking very strong and in fact the best out of their competitors. We then move on to insider ownership, 0.26%, one instant of insider buying over the last 12 months for around 250000 Although we do know four instances of insider selling for a significant amount, $39.64 billion. When we take a look to see when the nearest period was, you have to go back to quarter four with around 2.3 million worth of sales by the insiders. In terms of who these individuals were, well, what we can see, the more recent performance here, Ryan Campbell, an insider on the essential 2nd of October 2023, sold over 6,000 shares for just over $2 million. Information is there if you do want to see others. We have the US Congress members buys and sells, not something we incorporate into our own investment thesis, but the information, the transparency is there if it is something you like to even just look at. In terms of institutional ownership, 69%, we have 10.76 billion worth of sales over the last 12 months. We have around 50% more buys than sales over the same time period. Although we do want to point out in quarter one, the latest data point we have that institutions have been selling more shares than they have been buying. So in conclusion, insiders, as we can see, are selling a lot more than they're buying. Institutions over the last year have been buying more. But as we notice in Q1 of 2024, that institutions have in fact been selling more in the recent quarter. So before we do jump into essentially the dividend safety and the underlying metrics, just to let you know, we have released our latest free week, the article 20 undervalued stocks to consider for the portfolio. If you want to gain access to this or any others all completely free, click on that pinned comment below to sign up. We also want to draw your attention to this article. Lots of people like to ask what are the websites and resources we use. It is all within this article, so you can go ahead and copy the same analysis. Also, let's just jump into their call to coup earnings call from this morning and a few things we want to point out. So this is a comparison of their results for this quarter versus the same quarter in 2023. So we know not great, down 12% on their net sales and revenues. We can see just on their sales for the equipment operations, down 15%. Net income, down 17%. Earnings per share, down 12%. So 
Not great when you do compare it, and this is what we mean by cyclicality. But as always, it is good to invest in companies when they are out of cycle at the lower prices and valuations, and then ride them up to when they become in favor. The next thing we did want to point out, very important, is their forecasted FY24 full year, something we did discuss right at the beginning of the episode. 7 billion is what they anticipate, and they did lower it significantly, nearly 10% from what they had originally expected. So just something to incorporate and understand. And what we thought was quite interesting from their investor presentation it is the way that they use their cash their priorities as we can see here their main commitment here is that balance sheet ensuring it does look very strong as we did discuss earlier on they then talk about operating any growth in these in third place they talk about the dividend and we see the share repurchase being essentially the fourth point or their fourth priority when that is only something they do once all the above requirements are met so let's jump into the analysis. Dividend safety score 83, very safe. Market cap 115 billion. It is a mega cap company. And when we take a look at their dividend safety, we in fact see it was reaffirmed just a couple of months ago. Dividend cut does look to be highly unlikely. Now in the last recession, while they didn't increase the dividend, they didn't cut it either. They maintained it during the 0709 crash. They had below recession sales, negative 20% with the S&P negative 12%. But they also underperformed negative 65 when the S&P itself came in at negative 55. Now, in terms of dividend growth, this is a high quality dividend growth company. Double digit increase over the last full year, 14% over the last five years. And over the last 20 years, they have been increasing those dividends 13% year on year. We do, however, note there is three years of consecutive increases with 30 years of paying a dividend without a reduction. Now, let's take a look at dividend yield theory. For those that are new, it does state a company is undervalued when the current yield sits above the five-year average. 1.45 versus 1.3, so you could argue some signal here of undervaluation. Although we do know the forward P isn't too far off the five-year average. And when we compare it, the industrials, however, does sit in terms of sector P much higher at 19.9. We can also take a look now at the current trading price, and we can see it is starting to go down further, around negative 4%. So it doesn't look like this is a company that will recover the total negative at this moment in time so let's look at their free cash flow power as always the earnings is susceptible to manipulation by management through accounting 40 percent or lower for this power ratio for industry specific what we noticed 36 percent in 2023 looking fairly positive 29% expected in 2024, so very low. No surprises. We should expect, in fact, those dividends to continue increasing at a double-digit rate. And one of the things that management do focus on is having that payout around the 30 to 40% level, although we do know it isn't consistently always around that. 2022, 146%. This indicates that in that year, management paid out more in dividends than they generated from free cash flow. And that is one of the reasons why we don't look at the earnings, not something you would have been able to derive if you looked in the same year where it was around 18%. Moving on to the free cash flow share, as always, increasing free cash flows is what we want to see. 239 in 2014, 1410 in 2023. So it has been increasing, but also notice the cyclicality. In fact, 2017 to 2019, very poor. Then it looked very strong in 2020 to 21. Then it dropped, and we can just see very inconsistent. Nice to note, 2024 is expected to be slightly higher. Then we look at the sales growth, something we analyzed earlier, but in a percentage format, we can see last three years, very strong, 9% on a trailing 12-month basis, but also realize four of the last 10 years have been negative. So this is what we would call a cyclical company, just something to factor in into your own analysis. Total sales, we did look at this earlier, just a different format here. But over the longer term, they have done some share buybacks, effectively returning excess cash to your pockets as shareholders. But as we can see, not very consistent. And in terms of that investor presentation slide, in terms of when we look at priorities, it is right down there at the bottom after offering those very nice double digit increases to the dividend. So ROIC then, return on invested capital, 10% or more to give us faith that Mandarin can effectively allocate their capital. And what we do note above that over the last three years, 18% on a trailing 12-month basis does look very strong, but also they have gone through a six-year stretch where it was below that. So always good to keep up with these numbers just to ensure they are on the right track, especially if you invest in individual stocks. Now, in terms of the operating margin, above 15%, they've achieved that over the last three years. But again, prior to that, the last seven, they did struggle. In terms of the free cash flow margin, above 5%, very, very mixed. Again, do understand the type of company this is. We don't see a lot of consistency in these numbers. Net debt to EBIT, 
EBITDA then the earnings before interest tax depreciation amortization these are the number of years it would take the company to pay off all of that debt net of cash on hand below 2.5 and in fact it has been pretty much below that every single year 1.04 in 2023 1.45 expected so a bit of a jump into 2024 but when we do in fact look at that free cash flow payout looking low no worries to that dividend safety also bear in mind this metric does correlate to balance sheet strength as well all looking good there no massive red flag indicators other than the fact you need to understand they have lowered their forward guidance so do incorporate that into your analysis so let's jump into the valuation model as always if you do enjoy the content values being provided smash that like button hit that subscribe and bell button so you are continually notified of these videos as they drop first model we're using today is the dividend discount model we have the growth rate looking very strong over the last few years average 14 percent for this period forward looking we have gone for 6.5 percent to be a lot more conservative this gives an intrinsic value here showing some marginal undervaluation $400 market value around 417 based on this DDM model. We then move on to the DCF model free cash flow year on year average growth rate around 20%. Again, we've tried to be a lot more conservative given the cyclical nature of this company. With the discount rate, we get the present value of future free cash flows and terminal value. Add together with the cash, subtract total debt, get to the equity value, divide by the shares outstanding. And we can see here a very large undervaluation signal, 46719 as the intrinsic DCF model number. So in terms of the intrinsic value in today's episode, it is purely the average of these two that you see on screen, coming to a total of $442. And as always, you can grab a copy of the valuation model to get to both your intrinsic and acceptable buy price whether it's companies in your portfolio or those on your watch list. Margin of safety then, 10%. We execute on the three criteria, wide moat, strong financial metrics, good forward-looking data. And what we can see in today's episode, it isn't too far off a 10% MOS level. Whether or not that is enough for you to add to this position or not, that is something that comes down to the individual investor. For me, I do need to see a larger margin of safety, especially given it is a cyclical company. In terms of a 15% MOS level, a bar up to 376, at 20% at 354, and at 25% around 331, which personally I do believe would be enough to enter into this position at $332. But in today's episode, just has a 10% margin of safety. In terms of Wall Street and their expectations, well, as we can see, they believe the share price will go up to $430. Not too far off our intrinsic value with implied upside of 8%. As I said, not one for me that I am looking to add to the portfolio now. Although overall it is a high quality company, a strong dividend grower and at the right price, it is definitely one to consider. As always though, do let me know your thoughts in the comments below, whether you're looking to buy, hold or sell. And if you enjoyed today's episode, smash that like button, hit that subscribe and bell button. And as always, we'll see you all on the next one.